Sunday. My name is Dennis Ja, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In our discussion today, we're going to be talking about the notorious Bella Yala prison, which operated from 1910 to 1990. My guest is someone who has written about Bella Yala. He studied Bella Yala. He researched it. He learned about it. He went there. He was there. And he's here to share with us tonight. I have the honor to welcome Dr. No. Timothy D. L. Nevin. Dr. Tim, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you uh, giving me this invitation and uh, opportunity to share my research. Thank you. The last time we were here, we talked about Madame Swa Coco. Now you are here to talk about Bella Yala. Bella Yala is that prison in that used to be in Bap, now Bapolu, Liberia, mm -hmm. where successive president used to incarcerate, to imprison hardened criminals and banish their political opponents. I love this. I'm very, very glad that you're here today. We want to mm -hmm. welcome all our viewers from across the globe. This is Focus on Liberia, where we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberian. We used to sing a song growing up. All the packet pickers send them yeah. to the Yala. We yeah, sang that song. Right. And you were able to research this, so I'm very, very happy to have you here tonight discussing Bella Yala. Again, welcome. We are so happy to have you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. And that song was sung by my friend, Mayata Zo, who is uh, trying to get a government pension right now. She's she's very old, you know, she's like in her 80s now. And that song, uh, Send the Pocket Pickers to Bella Yala, was indeed a, a popular song. We're still trying to track down the original um, recording of that song. It's very hard to find because, of course, the Civil War destroyed uh, so many of those old recordings uh, that were on vinyl record. But um, that song later during the 1980 coup, you know, people changed the words to uh, all the Congo people send them to Bella Yala. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not funny, well, but that's, uh, that's, that's, that's our history. Right. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that was, that was a popular song. That's Yata Zo. And, yeah. um, and she, uh, you know, she also sang the song, uh, All the Young Girls Stop Drinking Lysol, which right. was another topic, yeah. Yeah, that Lysol that we, they were using for abortion. So Right, and also for suicide, For too. suicide, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, Dr. Tim, you were here before. You taught at uh, the Tottenham University. You also taught at Cottetown. Tell us a little bit about your librarian experience, even before someone watching us today said, hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, right. Talk to us about that. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, uh, my first experience really with li with Liberians and and uh, was with the uh, refugee resettlement program. I worked with people at uh, Purimpuram camp, you know, in Ghana. Was I was there. a resettlement officer uh, with the uh, uh, OPE Overseas Processing Entity of Church World Service, which was. Uh, doing uh, the family reunification program with Liberian refugees uh, back in the year 2001. And so I was actually in Ghana working on that during the 9-11 attacks. You know, that's basically uh, 20 years ago now. Uh, I was a caseworker, you know, working with Liberian refugees. And it got me thinking, like, you know, what are the root causes of the Liberian Civil War? I mean, why all these displaced people with these horrible stories that they have to tell me? as a caseworker uh, trying to get to the United States, you know, in the resettlement program to join their relatives uh, in places like Philadelphia, Minneapolis, you know, Houston, all over. So um, <clears throat> that's what kind of got me interested in Liberian history is working as a caseworker with Liberian refugees uh, back about 20 years ago. And then um, anyway, I, I completed my PhD in African history in uh, the year 2010. Uh, at University of Florida. And then after that, um, I ended up taking a job uh, teaching full-time at uh, Tubman University. That's in Harper, Maryland County. And I ended up teaching there for two years in total from 2011 to 2013. And then uh, I took a break uh, for a year or so, went back to University of Florida. And then I took another job 
uh, teaching at Cuttington University that's in Swakoko, Bonk County, Swakoko District. Uh, and I taught at uh, Cuttington University from 2015 to 2018, so for three years. Um, and that's where I did, uh, actually the first, the first uh, a stint at Tubman University is where I started this research on Bella Yala and I, I took the motorbike up there to Bell Yala and I interviewed as many people as possible. Uh, and I also interviewed a lot of um, uh, former political prisoners uh, living in Monrovia today, uh, which we can talk about we can talk about later. But essentially what I wanted to do with this article, it's been published in the Journal of West African History, which is uh, the Michigan State University um, publishes it. And um, it's about 47 pages of history of uh, Bella Yala. And I wanted to start at the beginning when it was, when it was uh, constructed back in 1910 and go all the way to the history of when it was uh, destroyed uh, in 1990. I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing your... Oh, sorry. There you Welcome, go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Focus on Liberia, our topic, the notorious Bella Yala prison with Dr. Tim Evans with Dr. Tim Nevin. What yeah. we're going to be talking about, we're going to start with the, uh, the history of Bella Yala that started from 1910 to 1919. We're going to talk about the construction in 1910, the physical space, the geography of the place. Yeah. And we're also going to talk about how Bella Yala was utilized by various presidents, including Edwin Barclay, William V.S. Tudman, William R. Tudbert, Samuel K. Doe, as a place of banishment by their political opponents. And we are going to look at some notable prisoners of Bella Yala. We have some even right here in the United States. We've extended an invitation for one of them to appear. We're working out the logistics to just appear for even five minutes so that we can make this live. Dr. Tim, yeah. let's, let's start. And you went to, you actually went there, you didn't sit somewhere in the comfort of your home to do this. Right. You actually went to Bella Yala and we have some pictures here that we're gonna show. But let's yeah. get started with the history. Great. Why was Bella Yala built? Okay, great. So um, I've got my article here. Uh, essentially, <clears throat> it was built as a post outpost for the Liberian Frontier Force. Uh, if you know the Liberian Frontier Force was Liberia's first army, and they were created in 1908. And they one of their tasks was to um, enforce the border, uh, control of the area around the border, and uh, you know, Bella, you know, Lofa River up there, uh, basically the 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 border with French Guinea and stuff. So the French were pressuring the the Monrovia authorities, the Liberian government to be able to police the border. And um, if certain people, you know, committed crimes or whatever, or, or were in insurrection on the French side, uh, sometimes they would come over to the Liberia side. And the French government basically said that to the Liberian government, if you can't, if you can't um, uh, police the border area or maintain you know, maintain the peace uh, in that area, then we're gonna take more territory away from the territory that you're claiming. So originally the Liberian government claimed territory all the way up to the headwaters of the Niger River, basically creating like a, like a triangle shape with the, tri the apex of the triangle being the start of the Niger River, which is now in Guinea. Uh, but anyway, um, of course, you know that over time, you know, England and France both uh, took uh, territory away from the original territory that was claimed by Liberia because the Liberian authorities didn't really have what they call effective occupation of those territories. So Bella Yala prison was created, uh, not the prison, it was actually called Camp Bella Yala. It was a military camp uh, for the soldiers. So the original prison was a post stockade, which was meant for soldiers that disobey orders right, or break the rules uh, somehow. 
So um, Camp Bella Yala was there as a string of camps uh, created to police the, the border region back in 1910. And it was made out of wood and uh, mud bricks. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. And starting the research, we see uh, Dr. Tim right there in 2012. Mm-hmm. Going yeah. to Bella Yala. So, <clears throat> again, a little more in the history of Bella Yala. And uh, let me know when I can show some of these pictures. But here is yeah. Dr. Tim in Bella Yala. You, so, this was during the research. Right. So, um, so, of course, I wanted to visit the place. And I've got my notebook there to take notes. And I wanted to sketch the area and talk to residents of Bella Yala town, you know, because they are still upset that whenever people think of Bella Yala, they say the name Bella Yala, people originally, they always think of the prison. Uh, they don't think of the town, you know, but now it's, there's a town there, Bella Yala town has always been there. But now there's, when I visited, there was about 12,000 residents in that area. Um, and there's also gold mining, artisanal gold mining in the creeks around there. Um, in what is now uh, Barpaloo County, it used to be called Lower Lofa County. Before it was Lower Lofa County, it was called the Western Province, part of the Western Province. Uh, and before that, it was just part of what they call the hinterland, uh, hinterland of Liberia. So the, uh, the reason that the, the townspeople are upset, you know, is because they don't want to be associated with the prison anymore. The, you know, the prison was... Um, you know, liberated or uh, basically uh, burned. It was, the, the prisoners were released in 1990, during the 1990 war by the NPFL uh, rebel faction. And so um, so you think about it now, there hasn't really been a prison at Bella Yala since 1990. So that's, how many years ago is that? It's over 30 years ago, right? Yeah. And so that's why the townspeople, they want to be known uh, for uh, something, you know, other than the, the prison, you know, because yeah. it's a stigma. It's a stigma for them. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so, in so, the, the clip that you showed, it talks about how, you know, Bella Yala was like a, a Liberia's devil, Devil's Island. Well, yeah. Devil's Island is a place, is a infamous prison in the colony of French Guiana, and that's in South America. And um, the movie Papillon, if you heard of Papillon, or that book was, was filmed there. And it was a place where the French authorities would send notorious criminals to this island uh, off the coast of South America, uh, you know, uh, called Devil's Island. Now, the reason that there's a similarity between Bella Yala and Devil's Island and I would also argue that um, that Belyala is kind of like South Africa's island. Um, it's Liberia's version of, of Robben Island in South Africa, which is where Nelson Mandela spent, you know, um, over two decades as a the most famous uh, ever. So anyway, the reason why there's the similarities between um, Robben Island in South Africa and Bella Yala in Liberia is because of the remoteness. So Bella Yala was in the middle of the rainforest, uh, in the middle of this really dense rainforest, and there's no roads going to Bella Yala um, until very recently. There was only footpaths and so, um, no roads. So with these uh, in more recent times, uh, in the later Tubman years, and then in the Doe administration, the political prisoners would be flown in uh, with these small army planes. So there was no roads to drive them there. So it was isolated. And that's why, you know, I believe that uh, it's the extreme isolation was why it made a uh, ideal place for governments to send these people that they wanted to get rid of, you know, political prisoners, but also hardened criminals, you know, people like um, convicted of murder, uh, rape, other things. But also, um, as you saw in the video clip, uh, Dennis, 
you know, people were just picked up off the street. They were considered vagrants, you know, and then sent to Baliala as well. So you had this weird mix of uh, political prisoners and you had uh, hardened criminals. Then you had other people that were picked up for like spur uh, spurious charges that weren't really serious criminals at all, but were just kind of considered riffraff or vagrants or, you know. But it's it's the isolation really. Uh, it's really hard to get there, um, and it's because of the lack of uh, of a, a decent road to get there um, that makes it so. Uh, but it, it goes. It's deeper than that, though, because it's right. actually Bella Yala was created in the homeland of the Bella people, which the Bella people are one of the sixteen ethnic groups of Liberia. They can sit. They they. To call themselves the Kuwa people because like that thing. Uh, Bella in the Mandingo language means cannibal. Like, like that thing. Yeah. Your, your, your video was freezing a little bit, so I will let you go over, over those again. But at what point yeah. did Bella Yala move from being Camp Bella Yala for the military people to be yeah. a prison for hardened criminals and political prisoners? That's a great question because um, if you look, I've got the quote here in my article. Uh, According to the Liberian constitution, no person charged, arrested, restricted, detained, or held in confinement uh, should be kept in a military facility except for military personnel. So it's actually illegal to keep civilians uh, in Balayala, which is run by the, the army, you know, it's a military prison. So it goes against the constitution to have civilians there at all. But the first um, first political prisoner that we know of um, was the uh, Dr. Francis Marias, um, who I think I sent you that book that was published by his uh, relatives about his life. Um, he was sent there in 1933, and that was after he had uh, come back from Switzerland, and he was pleading the case of the um, the crew people uh, about the this has to do with the um, Fernando Poe uh, slavery scandal. So he was talking to the League of Nations people in Switzerland about the Liberian government's treatment of crew and Grebo men who were being essentially kidnapped and forced to go to Fernando Po uh, and work as indentured servants, were essentially like slave labor. Um, they were getting paid, but not very much, right? So this was a scandal that almost cost Liberia its sovereignty back in the 1930s uh, and late 20s. So he, um, he was the first person he was arrested without a warrant and sent to Bella Yala for 15 years. That's wow. in um, 1932. And they forced him to walk, apparently, with military escort walk to Bella Yala, which, is, um, which took several weeks, uh, apparently. Um, and then he served uh, six months of his time there. Then he was sent to the prison in Cape Palmas. So, um, Charging him with sedition, so so he walked from Monrovia to Bella Yala. Yeah, yeah. and it took. Yeah. So what? The army people were they walking to with him? Yeah, escort. Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> I know, uh -huh. and that was part of that was part of the punishment, and that was under um, that was uh, Edwin that Barclay. was yeah the first that was under Edwin Barclay. So. In 1930, President uh, King, uh, Charles uh, CDB King, Charles King, uh, was forced to resign over the Fernando Poe crisis or the the uh, scandal about the uh, Fernando Poe forced labor scandal. So he was forced to resign, and then um, Edwin Barclay uh, took his place. And then Edward Barclay was the one who um, carried out this vendetta against. Uh, Dr. Um, Marias, 
And uh, we still have several, the Marias family in, in um, Maryland County is still very prominent, by the way. Yeah. You've got Dan Marias as a senator, right? Yeah. Right. So that's, that's he's one of the, uh, the ancestors or the uh, uh, descendants of, yeah. of this person we're talking about, Dr. Mariah. So um, essentially, that's she. He's the first. He's the first one that we know of. Right. So you were freezing at that time. Let's let's uh, quickly we talk about the uh, construction, the physical yeah. space, and the geography. So Bella Yala mm -hmm. is in Bapulu, and uh, right. it's in the middle of nowhere. Right. So, right. So and let's talk about the construction, the physical space, and the geography one one more time. Yeah, sure, no problem. So, so it was it was uh, called the hinterland until it was divided into three provinces: uh, eastern province, central, and western province. And and the Bella Yala town was, and the Bella people are in what was called the western province uh, until that area was divided into counties by President Tubman and Lofa County was created. So it was what cons considered Lof lower Lofa County. Um, but it was it, the, I, the placing of um, the prison there or sending political prisoners there was supposed to in, uh, strike fear into the hearts of people. The reason was because Bella Yala had the reputation that this is a place that people never return from. You would be sent there, but you wouldn't come back. In other words, you would die there, you know. And uh, there's a lot of reasons to fear the place. It was very uh, incredibly isolated in the middle of this rainforest. It's not an island, but it is surrounded on two sides by rivers. And it's close to the Lofa River. Uh, and there's two creeks that are right there. So there's a river system um, that sort of surrounds the area, no bridges or anything like that going across these rivers. Uh, but the other thing is that um, it was in the heartland of the Bella people. Now, the Bella, the chiefs of the Bella people uh, sent delegations to Monrovia and they made peace, you know, with the uh, Arthur Barkley government that's in around 1900, this is shortly before the, the Bella Yala camp was formed. And so they were considered an ally of the, the central government in Monrovia uh, at the time when Camp Bella Yala was constructed. And so I think that's one of the reasons why is because the Liberian government said, okay, these Bella Yala, these Bella people are loyal to us and they've pledged their loyalty to the Liberian Republic. And so uh, we can we can construct this uh, Spella Yala camp there, and it's close to the border with uh, with French Guinea, right? So, but the thing is that the Bella people is one of the smallest ethnic groups in Liberia, and they were so isolated in the rainforest, they got uh, they developed this reputation uh, for cannibalism, and I don't I don't think this is true. I think. Cannibalism is something that you accuse your enemies of doing, and it's something that makes you less than human, right? I mean, right. cannibals are people that are sort of subhuman, less than human. And so the Bella name in Mandingo, Mandingo language, is uh, apparently refers to this idea of, uh, of cannibalism Cannibal. or being cannibals, right? So they were so isolated, they were... They were uh, they were referred to as cannibalism, and I've got a I've got a map actually from Harry S. Johnson, this book from 1902 called Liberia, and on the map where it says it says Bella Country, and then underneath it it says cannibals. Wow. Yeah. yeah because I heard you, the their names should be Kua. Right, okay. Kua, so, Kua. That's yeah, the, Kua, the Kua, they, but they call they them Bella, which is derogatory. Right. So the word, the term Bella Yala actually means the water side of the Bella people. That's what it means. Right. Oh, because it's right on the creek there. So um, anyway, it was, it was a fearsome place to put a uh, prison because prisoners felt that if they were sent there, they would never return. They're uh, surrounded by these Bella people that are supposedly cannibals. 
And then there's also um, all these wild animals, right? So it's the rainforest. And if you try to escape from Belayala prison, uh, running away in the rainforest at night, you could be eaten by wild animals. And the reason I say this is because as late as 1964, we have a letter. I found a letter in the National Archives on 12th Street in Sinkor, the Sindra National Archives. We have a letter from the commander of the Belayala prison written to President Tubman. And in 1964, he sent President Tubman a gift of elephant tusks and a gift of leopard teeth and also leopard skin. So what that means is that the forest surrounding Bella Yala, even as late as 1964, it still had elephants and leopards. Wow. So this prison was uh, disbanded in uh, 1990. They freed the prisoners. And uh, at some point, uh, President Sully went there. Let, let, let bring you some of the pictures that we, you, you, mm -hmm. you share with us. Yeah. So I uh, say something about each picture as I show it, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Great. So this is a picture I took, um, I believe, in 2012. I went back and I visited again in, 2014, in 2015. I was there again. Um, so the, this is the ruin. This is the, um, the, the, the ruin of the concrete shell, as you can see. Um, during the 1990 war, the roofing was stolen from the roof. And so then it allows the rain to come in and then it allows uh, trees to grow, small trees and scrub uh, bush to grow inside the remains or the ruins of the, um, of the prison. So you can see those trees, those trees are actually growing from inside the walls uh, of the prison because there's no roof. Uh, it's just open to the rain and the elements. You see those trees coming over the wall. So that is uh, part of the annex that was built by uh, Samuel Doe during the military dictatorship. Um, I believe in 1984, he built the concrete annex. But he's the one, Doe's the one that, um, that uh, remodeled the prison and built the concrete structure that survives today. Uh, as essentially as walls, just the walls uh, survive. This is a photo that was taken when uh, Alan Johnson visited the ruins of the prison. You can see the unmill soldiers standing in front of the main entrance there to the Belayala prison. Uh, those are the blue hats. And then there she is uh, uh, visiting and taking a tour. Uh, she did visit several times, like three or four times. Um, and, you know, we can talk about why. I mean, the reason she visited was because uh, back in um, 1980, you know, she was afraid that she was going to be sent there herself by Samuel Doe. I mean, when she had a falling out with the Doe government and she was... Um, thrown into the BTC, uh, the Bar uh, Barclay Training Center, BTC Barracks, um, in the, the post stockade at the BTC Barracks, she was afraid that she was going to be sent to Bella Yala and she might not come back. And so uh, uh, Ellen Johnson was never sent to Bella Yala. She was, um, there was pressure put on the Doe's government by the US government and the American uh, embassy in uh, Monrovia to release her from the prison. And so she uh, she never went to Belayala but uh, as a prisoner, but she was afraid that she was going to be sent there. Um, this is the motorcycle and the motor the motorbike driver that took me um, during the first time. And you can see there's no bridge at that point over, this is the Tuma Creek. Tuma Creek, which is about maybe one mile away this crossing is about a mile away from Belayala town. And they put the motorbike on this raft and then pulled it across the river using a rope. Uh, you can see the ferryman there pulling um, the raft across by hand. 
So later a bridge was built over that site and during Unmill, when Unmill was there, they built, they put a bridge over that creek. Um, so, and put the, put the raft guy out of business. But anyway, that was, yeah, that was, um, that was from my journey. I, I took that photo going across the uh, Tuma Creek. Um, so this is an older photograph and it's, sorry, it's hard to, it's not that clear, but this is an, uh, photography was, was not allowed uh, at Bella Yala because it's a military facility. So as you know, you're not supposed to take photographs at military facilities because they're considered to be, you know, uh, state secrets there or whatever. <coughs> but that photograph showed a prisoner in the middle with a log, a chain to a log. So he couldn't go very far. He was, his leg was chained to this, this log right there in the middle. You can see the log next to his foot there. And you can see some of the prison guards who were soldiers, you know, and that's probably when the commander on the on the left side of the photograph, but the prisoner is in the middle uh, wearing that white T-shirt. Okay. So, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing the Bella Yala prison, and I may add the notorious Bella Yala prison. My guest is yeah. Dr. Timothy D. Nevin. He's done an extensive research that covered four years of this prison, and he's written about it. We're here to discuss Bella Yala prison. The next in our discussion, we'll see how mm -hmm. various presidents utilize Bella Yala, starting with Edwin Buckley. You already uh, kind of alluded to it with uh, Dan Mariah. So let's walk through these presidents and how each of them utilize Bella Yala. Right. So to make a long story short, the... Um the two presidents that really use Bella Yala prison as a uh, place for to send political prisoners, um, but also as a, a symbol of fear, to strike fear into the hearts of people. Um, those two presidents are uh, President William V.S. Tubman, and the other president is uh, Samuel Canyon Doe, uh, who enlarged the prison. Uh, during the 1980s. So um, there's certain periods or points in Liberia's history where uh, more people were sent to Bella Yala. One of those times was after 1955. Um, if you've heard about this, you're probably too young to remember, but 1955, there was uh, this thing called the plot that failed against President Tubman. And this was an interesting uh, event where it was like a staged assassination attempt and, and President Tubman was in the Centennial Pavilion there on Broad Street, uh, Ashman, between Ashman and Broad. And they were having a program there and uh, this guy named Paul Dunbar, who was a, a former police officer, uh, came in behind him with a gun and started shooting off uh, bullets in the... Uh, uh, in, into the centenary pavilion right in front of President Tubman. But miraculously, he was only a few feet away from President Tubman, but miraculously, President Tubman uh, was, was not hit by a bullet. So he was very close. Uh, so it was a very poor assassination attempt, you know, on <laughs> his part. But uh, President Tubman said that this assassination attempt, which I believe was a fake assassination attempt, uh, President Tubman never tried to jump out of the way or, or go flat on the floor or anything like that. It's like he knew it was coming, you know. So, uh, but anyway, he used this, he used this as so supposed assassination attempt to outlaw the independent True Week Party. So the independent True Week Party was being run by um, by uh, his uh, the his predecessor um, to uh, and some other prominent uh, politicians, and they were like actual uh, political rivals of, of his. So that um, Edwin Edwin Barkley uh, was was one of the movers and shakers behind between the uh, behind the Independent True Week Party, right? So. Um, there was a raid then uh, on the Coleman farm in um, 
uh, on the St. Paul River that killed David Coleman and some other people involved in the independent True Whig Party. And after that, after 1955, so some people were sent to Bella Yala, like Paul Dunbar, the, um, the alleged assassin, was sent to Bella Yala. But uh, after that, political opposition was really um, uh, suppressed after 1955 by the one-party state, which is the True Whig Party, which increasingly became under the control of President Tubman as his own personal party. So, um, so President Tubman sent a bunch of people there whenever he, whenever he th felt threatened personally. And Kenneth Best, I think you know Kenneth Best. I've got a yeah. Kenneth Best quote. Ever. A quote for you. Kenneth Best said that uh, Tubman during the Tubman era from 1944 to 1971, the right of habeas corpus was perennially suspended by the hand-picked rubber stamp legislature of President Tubman. According to uh, his newspaper, The Daily Observer, this gave Tubman the power to arrest anyone at any time, keep, them, uh, keep the victim in jail for as long as the president, president wished. Many never had a proper trial and many never returned which collectively represents a gross miscarriage of justice. So, as I said before, Bella Yala is a military prison, so civilians aren't even supposed to be there at all. But President Tubman did send uh, several of his political um, opponents uh, to Bella Yala over time, and several of them he later pardoned. And we have the example uh, we have several examples of this. If I can find it in my notes. Um, right. uh, yeah, so the good uh, in the 1960s, there's a great example. Uh, I talked to, uh, let me, uh, as I'm looking for it, let me read you this other quote from uh, this guy named Coco Walker from Harper in Maryland County. In the 1960s, said that people in, in Harper, people would honor the prisoner from the southeast returned from Bella Yala prison. People would honor that person by throwing a dance. They would dance in his honor because returning from there was such a rare and extraordinary experience. So the whole town would come out and throw a big dance for someone if they came back from Bella Yala because... They expected them to, to never come back, to never return from there. Um, and then Arthur Kula, if you know Arthur Kula, the former bishop who's passed away, yeah. he, his, yeah. he quoted from his book, it says that uh, Tubman was known for either buying out his opponents through a system of patronage or shutting them out through threats, intimidation, or imprisonment. Um, so Arthur Kula, you know, talks about uh, people being sent to Belliala in the 1960s. Right. Now, Dr. Uh, Tim, right. let's come to, uh, yeah. you, you talk about Ted, Barclay sent uh, Dan Marias. We have Tedman. Let's come to President Tubbert. Did he have any prisoners sent to Belliala? Right. Um, not as much. Uh, he, let me just finish really quickly with, with the Tubman. In the year 1964, uh, the prison was still relatively small with about 100 prisoners and 143 soldiers stationed there. So this is a ratio of more, more soldiers than prisoners. Um, but they provided, they, they established radio communications with Monrovia in 1964. Um, there was only about 400 residents of Bella Yala town at that time. But one of the more infamous political prisoners that President Tubman sent to Bella Yala was uh, the Army Colonel David Y. Thompson. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. He was court-martialed and found guilty of sedition, conspiracy, and disloyalty. So this is considered a crime by Tubman, being disloyal, right? It's actually, that's what he was charged with, being disloyal. 
you can't be an army colonel and be disloyal to President Tubman, right? So okay. he was sentenced to 10 years of hard labor at El Ayala. He was held a prisoner there from 1963 to 1966, and he almost starved to death. His, he was put on starvation rations. He was flogged repeatedly. He was immobilized in the stocks. He was denied food and water. He was humiliated, uh, cruelly starved, uh, put into solitary confinement. And then his, uh, another lawyer and fellow political prisoner, uh, Booker T. Bracewell, was actually murdered uh, at the same time, murdered wow. in Bella Yala prison at the same time when uh, Colonel David Thompson was imprisoned there. Mm -hmm. So these are two examples um, of political prisoners sent by, by Tubman. Now, um, if you're asking about President Tolbert. Right. So Tolbert uh, said that, you know, um, he was going to be different from President Tubman. He was, this is a new era, and he tried to basically reverse a lot of Tubman's policies. And so he tried to uh, create a um, freedom of the press. Uh, Tolbert said that under my administration, the press is going to be open and free, and you can publish whatever you want. Any criticism, you can, you can publish it in the newspapers. Um, so, um, so Tolbert was trying to be different, and he um, ended up um, uh, hanging people more than sending them to prison. There was a, a very famous uh, case of ritual murder in Maryland uh, County. The, the Yancey family, if you remember this, yeah. uh, one of them was accused of ritual murder. That's uh, extracting uh, body parts to be used in uh, ritualistic. Uh, well, rituals that uh, were allegedly to um, increase the uh, wealth or power of the, the person power, who's yeah. doing it, right? So, um, boyo business is a, was what they call it in, in uh, Maryland County. Yeah, boyo. Right. So, anyway, uh, Tubman decided to hang Tolbert. these people. Uh, Tolbert, sorry. Tolbert decided to hang these people instead of sending them to Bella Yala. Um, so he, um, at one point, uh, Tolbert did uh, threaten during the later years of his doomed administration, he threatened that troublemakers would indeed be locked up at Belayala, but he wanted to assert his identity as a different type of leader than President Tubman, uh, under whom he served as vice president for 19 years, right? With a completely different leadership style. So he apparently never followed through on his threat to send prisoners to Bella Yala. However, um, instead, on according to my good friend Christiana Ta, I don't know if you know who she is, Counselor Ta. Yeah, the She wrote a memoir, and I corresponded with her about this this subject. And she said on December fourteenth, nineteen seventy six, nine out of the ten political prisoners from Bella Yala were released on orders from the Ministry of Justice. So one of the last pr prisoners released at this time was a man named Slipway Borbor, who was in his early 40s, who had been locked up for 11 years at Bella Yala without trial, and he was accused of uh, theft, but he was never tried. So he was there for 11 years uh, and never put on trial. So, um, so really, so apparently Tolbert never sent anyone. It was, in fact, Tolbert released some people from, from Bella Yala. But Tolbert did visit Bella Yala, and I talked to the townspeople. In 1973, President Tolbert visited Bella Yala, according to former Lofa County Senator Isumu Jones. Uh, you might have heard of Isumu Jones. Yeah. Okay. He's still alive. I, I did a long interview with him, and uh, Senator Willie Bella was the uh, was there in Lofa County uh, during the time of that visit. During that visit, residents urged President Tolbert to move the prison somewhere else because they said Bella Yala is a chiefdom, not a prison. 
So they were tired of the stigma and the negative publicity that the prison was giving them. And so, um, so they urged him to move it somewhere else. President uh, Tolbert promised that he would take action on this matter and promised that a road would be completed, connecting them with Bapalu, which is the county seat of uh, Bapalu County right now. And Bapalu is the nearest uh, medium-sized town uh, so, to Dr. Like Tim, before Bella you continue, Yala. this, this yeah. uh, Bella Yala prison, how far, was it part of the Bella Yala town or is it like an outskirt of? Okay, good. Thank, thank you for that question. Um, it's adjacent to the town. So mm -hmm. it, it uh, borders the, there was a big wall. There was a, a big wall that separated the town from the prison. So if you go on the other side of the wall, you have um, this where the main street starts. And then uh, like a few blocks down, you start getting into the commercial district of um, Bella Yala town, uh, main street where they have the market and everything. So there, so that big, that, and I, and I think it's called broad street. Anyway, the, the main street in Bella Yala kind of ends right where the wall starts for one side of the Bella Yala complex. So the Bella Yala complex also had an airstrip, uh, which was later turned into a soccer field. They had an airstrip for small planes to land, and they had barracks for, um, for soldiers to sleep in, you know. Uh, so it wasn't just the prison. It was the barracks. There was the airstrip. There was, um, there was a cafeteria. There was a school there. And uh, one of the commanders, uh, Commander Norman, um, even built a uh, restaurant um, and a nightclub back back in the 80s that was um, on that property as well. So the town and the and the prison are right next to each other. What, what was the interaction like between the people in the town, the prisoners, right. the army? Okay, so it's really interesting because. It's really interesting because every day the prisoners were let out of the prison to perform uh, forced labor on the farms in the adjacent area. So they would be marched, be assigned to a farm. They would go, the ones that could do physical labor, you know, the ones that weren't sick, the ones that were strong enough to perform physical labor were, uh, were sent out during the daytime and then they would work the cassava farms, um, you know, harvesting uh, pineapples, edos, uh, sugarcane, all these, all these crops, right? So, and then at nighttime, before before dusk, they would be marched back to the prison, and then they would be in the prison all night. So the townspeople did sometimes interact with prisoners, uh, and then. Sometimes uh, prisoners were allowed to go into the town during the day. Uh, mm -hmm. Some prisoners actually even married people in the town. Some prisoners, when they were released, they stayed there in Bella Yala and they intermarried, uh, you know, with uh, women um, that live there in Bella Yala. So there was a lot of interaction, but at the same time, um, over the walls at nighttime, the villagers, or I should say the townspeople of Belayala, they could hear the prisoners, you know, groaning and uh, and and sometimes screaming, you know, and crying and things like that. So at nighttime, they could hear the noises that the prisoners would make uh, when the prisoners were in, they were in solitary confinement or they had injuries. There was there was no good uh, medical. Uh, medical right. care given to these prisoners at all. So, so the townspeople could hear these. Yeah, so the townspeople could hear these sounds at night and they would tell their children, they would say, good, you be a good child and behave or else I'm sending you to Bella Yala. Wow. So on whose farm were they working? Was it the uh, village people farm or the government farms? No, it was mostly the army commanders. Okay. It was the farms that are owned by the majors and colonels, you know, the army army people that own farms 
uh, in the area and they were providing free labor on those farms. Uh, and you can, you can ask uh, the folks that uh, Dempster Yala and uh, Ezekiel Pajibo and those folks that were part of the Revolutionary Action Committee uh, 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 6, the REACT 6, were there in 1985. You can ask them about the, the forced labor because they were, they were also, you know, um, uh, forced to, uh, to give their, their uh, forced labor or perform forced labor on these farms. Uh, but but yeah, so these are mostly there was all farms owned by local people, and the farm owners would come in the morning to the commander of the prison and work out a deal uh, to basically lease the prisoners for the day for like a, a day's worth of labor, and then they would come to some kind of deal and they could pay the commander of the prison something for these uh, prisoners to be, uh, to go there and work um, on the cassava farm or whatever they are growing for the day and then bring them back at night. And then they would have oh. soldier escorts. They would be by a soldier because they had a, a, a policy of one man for one. So this policy was essentially during the, started during the Tubman time where if a prisoner escaped Bella Yala, the soldier who was the guard, who was in charge of guarding that prisoner, uh, would take his place inside the jail. So that's how they did it. If someone escaped, the guard would be put in prison as a prisoner himself. So that was the yep. one man for one policy. So that's why, you know, these guards, uh, it was in their best interest to guard these prisoners very well. Because right. if the prisoner escapes, then they're going to be put in prison themselves. <laughs> right. So, so, and we have uh, Dempster Yala. He's watching. We hope we can, oh, we can call you and share that experience. But what was uh, before I come to 1980? And uh, because I saw these people my, myself, we're talking about mm -hmm. Dempster Yala, Ezekiel Pajibo. You also talk about uh, uh, Gabriel Pule. Uh, Lucia, Lucia Masseli. Right. So we'll, we'll come to that. But my question here right. is, how mm -hmm. was this? Because we hear most of these uh, human rights uh, organization calling for, you know, mm -hmm. writing about this. What was the international community reaction to these kind of conditions at Bella Yala? Were people condemning the government? Was there any action, sanction, and all mm -hmm. that? Or uh, nobody cared? Well, um, as, as you saw on that clip that you played, from what was it, 1970, that clip from YouTube, which was like, a, it was an American news organization. <clears throat> I think it was NBC News uh, that yeah. went up there. That was not favorable uh, coverage for President Tubman. I mean, that was a negative, you know, he interviewed prisoners who didn't really know why they were there. You know, they were picked up on vagrancy charges or accused of theft or something like that, but then they were never uh, taken to trial. They never had their day in court, you know, and so um, they were never, most of those prisoners were never formally charged with anything. And yeah. so there was also no representative ministry of justice on site there at Belayala because, like I said, it's a military prison. Um, it's run by the later by the Liberian National Guard. So it's, it's run by the army. And so, um, and so this is negative publicity. Now, during the Doe time, the population, the prisoner population at Bella Yala exploded. I mean, it got a lot larger. Yeah. Right? Because Bo a, was paranoid. I mean, he was paranoid and he that, wanted to hold on to power. So that's the period I want us to come to. So let me let me show right. some pictures, and you're going to go through with the uh, duo because I think he utilized Bella Yala the most. And uh, mm -hmm. we had the three opposition: uh, this uh, Jackson Doe, Gabriel Boulay, and Edward B. N. Kesselly. They were the uh, leaders of the Lab Loop and UP, and these were also right. sent to Bella. So there's your <laughs> picture there. We also have. Uh, at a time, Daily, Daily Star reported LPP member student released. 
uh, I believe that was Bella Yala or somewhere else. We also have this picture of uh, my friend Dempster Yala. He, he's, he lives here in Michigan. He's watching the feed right now. Uh, Ezekiel Pajibo, Lucia Masale, who's now Lucia Yala. And these are all prisoners of Bella Yala. And that's uh, another. This is uh, President Doe saying they will never be president. And he has the back right. of Matthew. <laughs> so, right. so let's talk right. about the right. Doe era and Bella Yala. Right. So we have to back up uh, right before Doe um, came to power in 1980. You know, in 1980, there were several prominent, um, uh, several prominent, uh, uh, Congo people, or I say America Liberians, that were sent there uh, to Belayala. And if I could uh, find their names, Uyi Jones was, was talking about that. Um, in, uh, here we go. Uh, on the orders of PRC member Larry Barty, um, yeah. Larry, Larry Isumu Barty Jones was sent. Isumu Jones was sent. Right. So Isamu Jones was sent there uh, after the 1980 coup. He was charged with rampant corruption, nepotism, abusing human rights, etc. Uh, and then um, there were several other people along with him. He talks about um, several other uh, new arrivals, and they were given 50 licks, which is uh, 50 lashes upon arrival. That's kind of their uh, initiation, right? But um, in 19, uh, if we go back to 1980, let's see. Oh, yeah. Here. Okay, here we go. 1982, um, there were a few people that actually escaped from Balayala, and one of them was the notorious uh, diamond thief, uh, Fred Chenoweth. He, was, he escaped in the 1970s. He was late, later captured and killed. But because of this, uh, Doe, after the coup, he decided to strengthen the Bella Yala prison complex and ordered a concrete jail building erected. So in other words, uh, he built a whole new structure with uh, thick concrete walls so that no one could escape. And that's in 1982. Um, and, these, and this concrete jail was supplemented later with a concrete annex whose walls uh, still stand today. You saw those photographs of the annex to the prison with the thick uh, walls uh, made out of concrete. So the commander in charge at that time in 1982 was a Kron man named David T. Norman. And he was transferred from the Tubman Military Academy at Todi, and he was sent there uh, to oversee the um, reinforcement of the Belayala prison uh, under the Doe uh, military rule, under the PRC military rule. And uh, about 175 AFL soldiers were sent there. And from the third battalion, was called the Belayala detachment. So the um, population rapidly increased. Um, even though when the when the prison when the soldiers at Belayala heard about the 1980 coup, there was wild jubilation. You know they were very happy because they were thinking this is our time now. Yeah, and what happened? Uh, well, so that's so increasingly um, more people were, were are sent over time. And then you have, of course, leading up to the 1985 election with, um, uh, let me, before I go to the 1985 election, let me just say in 1986, uh, Bill Berkeley, he's a journalist, visited Belayala. He described the prison as containing four big rooms, uh, approximately 30 square feet each, containing, accommodating 30 to 40 prisoners in each room. But during, um, uh, but but it was severely overcrowded, especially after the 1985 uh, coup attempt by Thomas Quiompa. So, as if you remember, 
during the early 80s, you know, um, Samuel Doe said that he was not going to run for president, that, you know, he's going to return the military to the barracks. And he made all these promises, even up through 1983, that he was not going to run for president. And then for some reason, un unbeknownst to only him or known to only him, he changed his mind and he decided to form his own party uh, and run for president. Uh, and then this is, of course, the infamous uh, rigged election of 1985, where you had the burning ballot boxes on the side of the road and you had soldiers taking ballot boxes to the barracks and destroying them and things like that. Where, where most observers believe that the real winner of the 1985 election was Jackson Faya Doe. And uh, by the way, Jackson Faya Doe was later uh, uh, arrested by Taylor, Charles Taylor and the NPFL forces. And Doe was, Doe was then later uh, executed in, um, I believe in Buchanan when he was a prisoner of uh, Taylor. So, um, so Doe was not the only one paranoid about, you know, uh, other people being more legitimate than he was in terms of that 1985 uh, election. So after, as we know, after the 1985 election was stolen uh, by Doe, then you had the, a few months later in November, you have the coup attempt by uh, Thomas Cuyompa, mm -hmm. who was uh, formerly one of Doe's best friends you know, from Nima County, but they had separated ways. And Thomas Cuyompa had several, had said many times publicly that he wanted the army to return to the barracks uh, instead of um, turning into a political party. Um, and so once the Thomas Cuyompa uh, coup failed in November, 1985, there was a backlash against all, um, alleged supporters or perceived supporters of Thomas Cuyompa. And not only that, but even against soldiers that had come from Nima County. So they're talking about the, the Don or the Guillo and Mano soldiers uh, in the AFL from, um, from Nima County were no longer safe. Uh, they were, many of them were um, arrested uh, and their loyalty to Doe was questioned once again. They were sent to Bella Yala, and after a certain point, when there was a certain number of um, soldier prisoners there in Bella Yala, uh, they were basically taken out and executed because they didn't want to have uh, too many soldiers being imprisoned in Bella Yala at one time because they thought it was a security risk. Uh, that Doe thought it was a security risk. So they would be taken out and executed if, when, when their number grew uh, too large. And we know some of these by names? Yeah, we do. You should, uh, I'm encouraging you to, uh, to read my article for more details. I have okay, some names so. of people and, in and we here. Will, and we will share that with our, yeah. with our audience. But let me, yeah. let, me bring in, let me bring in some of our comments. There are people watching. Yeah, sure. Here. They're, they're loving it. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, this is Focus on Liberia. We have our phone lines open, so you can call the number on your screen and make your contribution uh, on this it, very, very important subject, Bella Yala. It, that's the notorious Bella yeah. Yala. Go ahead, Doc. And, Doc. yeah, if I could just add one more thing, Dennis. You mentioned Gabriel Pole and uh, Jackson Fayado In a newspaper interview, they said, uh, they claimed that, quote, since the 1980 coup, hundreds of people have been killed and buried in mass graves at Bella Yala. So that was when they were released, they made that statement that there are, in fact, uh, mass graves there outside the grounds um, at Bella Yala. Wow. James Jensen say this is good information. Ernest say, Dr. Nevin, you taught me History 101 at Tottenham University in Tottenham Town, Maryland County. So you got some of your students here watching. Thanks, Ernest. Thanks, Dr. Nevin. I have heard the name Bella Yala, but not gotten the history of it. Thanks 
for educating me on it. Great job, Dr. Nevin. Keep it up. Like Roman said, great show this afternoon. Emmanuel Shemer, uh, he knows a lot than many Liberians. Thanks for the information, sir. And who says he's not a Liberian? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emmanuel. Well, I was I was an official resident. I was a, a legal resident of Liberia for five years, but I but I can't become a citizen of Liberia because of the Constitution. The Constitution exactly. said only people of African descent can become. A legal citizen. So until you guys change the constitution, then maybe I can become a citizen. And then I can say, we the Liberians. Yes. And uh, <laughs> the president, when he first speech, he declared that has been racist. So let's see what he's going to do about it. Uh huh. Or oh, Nelly K. Harris, Robert, all the Bella people are comfortable sitting and listening to you, sir. And oh, Nelly say, we are qua speaking people. And that's the that's the uniqueness about the Bella people because they have their cousins yeah. all the way on the southeast. Yeah. Jensen, do you have photos or videos of events narrated? We show you some photos, and at the beginning of the show, we play a video when uh American journalists went there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Henry P. Costa, thank you. So you know it's interesting if you if you read that book, the the legends of Liberia. Uh, the folklore of Liberia, there's a few compilations, but anyway, there's a legend about the founding of the Bella people, and it said that the, the Bella chiefdom was founded by a Basa hunter. So, so some Basa hunter had made his way north to that area and decided to stay and found the, the Bella chiefdom. So anyway, everybody is interrelated, you know, people are related to um, uh, through through blood, you know, in in Liberia. So, like Roman said, he heard that there was a Mandingo man who escaped from the notorious prison before. Mm -hmm. I won't be surprised. The people, escaped. yeah, there are a few, but like I said, there's the threat of wild animals eating you alive. There's that's that threat. There's also um, the practice that the soldiers had the practice of if someone escaped from Balayala and then they were later captured because. There would be a bounty, you know, on these people's heads. So the villagers were told that if they turn in an escaped prisoner, they would get some monetary reward, you know, like say twenty dollars or something like that. So if someone escaped from Belayala and then they were captured, sometimes they were brought back to the prison and they had their ankles broken. Oh, ouch. Yeah. And another another deterrent was the after trying to escape. The soldiers could cut off the soles of your foot with a knife. Jim Lassa said, Bella Yala and uh, Demsa Yala told me that this is called Yela. So, Bella mm -hmm. Yela. So, Bella Yela mm -hmm. is a pellet name for near the Bella water. Yala mm -hmm. has in Wela and Salala in Bong and Mount mm -hmm. counties, the dominant or majority ethnic group in Bapolu. So, the Right. So as I said, according to my information, you know, Bella Yala means the water side of the Bella people. Yeah. And yeah. it is indeed surrounded by water. There's several major rivers and creeks right there uh, at the in the vicinity of the Bella Yala town. And the largest river, of course, nearby is the Lofa River. James Mombasi, hope you bring this guest here again. I'm really enjoying him. Thank you, James. Demso Yala, one of the uh, former prisoners at Bella Yala, and he too hails from Bapolu County, even mm -hmm. though he uh, spent his, much of his time in the Firestone era. He said he's on, he's watching. James Toto, isn't yeah. Bella Yala synonymous to Bella ethnic group? The inhabitants are the Bella tribe today. Yes, that's that's exactly what we've been what we've been discussing. Yes. He said, where can we find your research? Is 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 it on JSTOR? I, I saw it somewhere, but it, you you have to subscribe or do something. Yeah, that's a great. I'm going to share it with you. Um, you know, uh, anyone who wants to email me and request a copy, you can uh, email me. Um, I have a few different email addresses, but you can email me at uh, tdnevin2020 at gmail. That's uh, td. N E V I N 2020 at Gmail. And I'll respond to your email and I'll send you my paper. So this 
this paper that I wrote is um, with the references. It's about 47 pages long, and it's it was published in the Journal of West African History. That's an online journal hosted by the Michigan State University. So I believe if you go to the Journal of West African History, their website, yeah. You can you can purchase it for I think it's five dollars you know online. Yeah. Um, so, so, so let them. You, let I'll them send purchase, it to you. Yeah, let them purchase it, or uh, Doctor Tim. Yeah. Or if they want that, they send they send uh they send that five dollars and they get a copy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Clotel right. says my late father Doctor Tim was sent to Bella Yella by President Du in 1983, and I personally met uh the late Doctor Tim, great writer I can say. Mm. Dr. Tim, we have some uh, we have some callers here, so we'll bring them in to interact uh, quickly yeah, great. as we uh, bring in more callers. So Dave Ja, he said there is a need for reparations for for victims of Liberian government anarchy against humanity. I will ensure that when I'm elected president one day. Dave is my brother, and he's saying he's, he's announcing his run for the presidency one right. day. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, let me listen to my back room. If we have callers, callers, uh, the lines are open. Your name and where you're calling from, and then we got this going. Caller, go right. ahead. Caller, your name number, and where you're calling from. Caller with phone number ending in. Oh, the caller is not paying attention, Dennis. All right, Call our okay. phone number NA in seventy three fifty four. Go ahead. Call are you there? All right, let's get to more comments. I also understand that prisoners' wives came up the prison town to be near their spouses. So if your husband is there, at yeah. least we relocate. Yeah, um, that that definitely could happen. Um, I spoke to the widow of. Um, David Norman, who is the last uh, commander there, and she uh, still lives there in Bella Yala, uh, in Bella, Bella Yala town. I wanted to mention one more thing about 1990, uh, the 1990 war. According to the townspeople, it was August 22nd of 1990. The prison was liberated uh, or stormed by a faction, a rebel faction of Charles Taylor's National Patriotic Front of Liberia, that's NPFL. And there were 89 prisoners at that time. They were set free and they fled. And many of them uh, voluntarily joined or were impressed into the rebels ranks. Right. Now, two people, the most famous prisoner at that time was Brady Allison, if you, you know that name. Yeah. Brady yeah. Allison was accused of being a part of a plot to overthrow Samuel Doe and he was framed for the murder of a policeman and banished to Bella Yala in August of 1989. So that's uh, one year previous, uh, prior to when the NPFL rebels uh, stormed the prison. Dennis? So, so yep. anyway, Grady Allison was taken by the NPFL uh, rebels and he was taken to Guangjama in Lofa County and he was executed there. Yeah. We have a call, Dennis. Uh, mm -hmm. Wele, go ahead. Yes, uh, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. All right, um, just want to tell you thank you for having a show that uh, is mm -hmm. so uh, relevant to our you know, political situation, past and present. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, the first one is that, you know, I, I just came on not too long ago, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you may have covered that, but I missed it. So just want to know, how did Bella Yala actually come into existence? Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Hold, hold on, Dr. Tim. Let okay. him finish with his question. If, if Go ahead. Ask the rest of your question, then we can take it the next caller. Okay. Yes, my second question is, is uh, Bella Yala uh, still in existence, and is it still used uh, to this day, in the same capacity, same way, or if not, how is it used, if it is? Th thank you. And your name again, and where are you calling from? Oh, uh, my name is Willie Dillon, and I'm calling from Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you. All thank right. you, Willie. Go ahead, Dr. Tim. So I, I can give a very short answer. We, we, just, we covered this stuff already, but the very short answer is that uh, 
Bella Yala was, was built out of wood and brick in 1910. It was part of this string of forts to police the border, the borderland area. And it was essentially uh, uh, barracks for the Liberian Frontier Force. So it was originally called the Post Stockade at Bella Yala. And it was, it was a military prison. So it was, uh, anyway, we, we were just talking about the demise, you know, so Bella Yala was used as a military base and also uh, a military prison from 1910 until 1990. So in 1990, the NPFL rebels came and they released all the prisoners and they um, uh, basically destroyed the prison. And actually the town of Bella Yala was burned down three times during the Civil War. And there was all kinds of uh, uh, monstrosities and atrocities that were committed against the innocent people of Bella Yala during the Liberian Civil War, just because of that reputation, you know, that Bella Yala was a government uh, center, you know, and all that. But so it is, it has not been active as a prison um, since August 22nd, 1990. And it remains in ruins today. So that's the photograph of it. And um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, when she was president, she promised several times to turn it into a museum or a, a place of memorial to, uh, as a memorial to the political prisoners that were sent there over the years, mostly by President Tubman and by President Doe. Uh, but she never followed through on her promise um, she left office and she forgot all about the people of Bella Yala. Um, and so that, that promise remains unfulfilled. Thank you. Dennis, we have yeah. uh, James Lassa on the line. James, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Uh, uh, good evening to all. I want to first begin by extending thanks to the uh, focus on Liberia family and to uh, Dr. Melvin himself for what is quite clearly a very fantastic show tonight. So, um, I just wanted to add some uh, little uh, reflections to the narrative, um, especially where uh, the guest spoke about uh, the name of the history behind the name Bela Yala. And of course, I heard somebody suggesting that John uh, uh, Yala had said that it wasn't in Yala, it should be Yala. Uh, either way, if it is Yala, it means the water, if it is Yela, it means near the hill. I will certainly go with the, the water interpretation. I hope I can find time to talk to uh, Dancer to get some clarity on that. But I just want to stress that uh, at this point, according to demographic data, uh, you know, I being a development, I'm interested in uh, any positive information that, pert that pertains to, to the Tela people and uh, they are raising of as the largest, the single largest uh, ethnic group uh, who actually are known to have uh, occupied most of central Liberia that we used to call Pella land that stretch from all the way from Sanikoli to Ganta to Lofa to Bong, Magibi, Masurado, Bomi, and Bapolu. So to this day, Bapolu is the largest ethnic group in Bapolu is the uh, is the Pele is the, is the Pele ethnic group, uh, and the name of the county is in fact Pele. Mapolu means behind the Bopolu, means behind the hill. And it's interesting to know that Bela Yala will certainly mean near the water. So that speaks of the, the, the influence and the uh, the number, the, the dominance of the uh, the Pele people in the vast uh, land area of Liberia, which uh, is quite an interesting thing to know, and I want to tell the um, the guest, thank you again for adding to whatever knowledge we had earlier uh, than now. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, James. Thank you. Mr. Sia, do yeah. we have any more color? Yes, we do. We we have a lot of colors here. Okay, so color quickly. We, you have uh, 60 seconds each. Let's do this quickly. And uh, I will jot them down and Dr. Tim can respond. Yeah. Uh, Josh Toto, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Apple, and uh, thank Dr. Dels, uh, Dr. Dels, uh, uh, I'm fascinated to, to really, to understand your, your research when, when it comes to the building of the, the better yellow forest. If you, if you look at, if you look at, uh, 
Park Nitra or Imi or Dakin Tien. The, the government adapter in Monrovia, the central government adapter, they, 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 they don't really take the either name into, into, into consideration. Everything was central in Monrovia. And there were no other engagement, especially in the border, the border town, in Lofa, Bon County, nearby other places. So I'm really thinking of uh, how you, um, how, um, why did you really find your research that in that in term, the whole, the whole bay of a prison center in the better forest? Yeah. Is it because, is it, uh, is it because the, uh, the French government, the, the French adapter in Guinea were approaching on like real property? Is it, the, is, it, is it one of the reasons? Yeah, Th thank you. Thank you. Well, let's take the ne next caller. All right. Caller with phone number NA in 7354. Please go ahead. Okay, this is James Jensen. I'm a son from Dera Yala. Okay. Okay, and. Uh, more importantly, the guest has touched my mind as the guy's uh, necessary information he's provided. Um, I know Liberia was divided into the eastern province, central, and the and the western province. And so his discussion is more historical, and I feel that there's more to, to learn from him. So I hope this session will probably find a better time to invite him again so that we will probably ask him some more detailed questions. Or if he has some information, a book that he has written or information will be glad to gather pieces of information. But as to the discussion today, I'm more concerned about the aspect of how did Berayara come about. There are uh, oral history that I have heard that Berayara, the people of Berek, may have come from the uh, the eastern province, meaning from uh, Grand Gideon or so, and went all the way and started down there. I think these historical dots need to be connected so that we all can understand where Ladro came from or where Liberians came from and what is the historical you know, uh, connection between the different tribes. And I think you are through a lot of life and I appreciate it for that. Th thank you. And we, we, we ran a series here on uh, the various ethnic groups on Liberia and we're still looking for someone from the Kua or the Bella ethnic group to, uh, to do that. Let's get the next caller, but thanks for calling. Um, yes, uh, caller, go ahead. Call out with phone number N42703. It's super overseas call. Go ahead. I'm calling from the UK. How are you doing? Uh, this is Carl Jago. Okay, Mr. Jago, go straight to it. Yeah, I got a quick, very short question. Mm -hmm. uh, was more at the time, and the story we heard about that person was, was it a motorway driving there or people need to fly a helicopter to get there? He said, well, nowhere in the bush. People couldn't find their way around. They have to fly you over the bushes and put you down so that there's no way you can escape the person. If you have become sad, you, you lost your way, you don't know how to get out of there. Can you, can you please clarify that, sir? Thank All you. Right. Then I'll take the final one here. Uh, final caller is Nelly Harris. Nelly, go ahead. Hello. Hey, Nelly, you're live. Nelly, go ahead. Okay, hello, Doc. Hey. Go ahead, Nelly. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for affording me the opportunity. I just want the doc to know that we are, we are, we are appreciating so much. And I want him to know that we are very thirsty and hungry about our district um, history, especially for me. Uh, we are appealing to him to please help us with more information because we don't have no history on our district. And we really want to know some of us are becoming to be educators. And we want to like set our premise. So we appeal that he help us in any way besides the history of the prison. If he has any history for the district, can you please help us? Thank you. All right. Th mm -hmm. Thank you, Nelly. And, and, and Nelly, are you still there? Yes. Uh, can you uh, can you say in Bella, hello, you are watching Focus on Liberia. I've never heard Bella before. Thank you so much. It's been a long time having Focus on Bella. So, <laughs> Now, corona did I? Now, I program for focus on Africa. 
a ya si se ve e cana na tabi so to una de tu no kuruli na mama to bre wow thank you thank you thank you so much <laughs> yeah thank you my first time hearing a sambo <laughs> yeah all right thank you so uh like your team here the question uh Judge Toto wanted to find out, you know, as to why the Bella Yala was established there, if there's any other reason. You 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 gave that from the beginning. Uh James Jackson say it, yeah, it was James Jackson who said how really Bella Yala came about. Right. Uh, but, but let me and then let me, can I clarify uh, just to clarify that answer. Essentially, Bella Yala, it starts as the called Bella Yala Camp. So it's, it's a military camp for the Liberian Frontier Force. It's basically, it's a base for them to go out, you know, and patrol the different areas and everything. It's only later, um, it's only later that the different presidents of Liberia realize that, wait a minute, uh, this place is so isolated, it would be perfect place to send, you know, troublemakers, what, what we consider to be Troublemakers are people that um, are political rivals uh, or political prisoners. Because if you lock them up in the uh, the BTC barracks or South South Beach prison, that's right there in Monrovia, and their family is right there. And there's a lot more pressure can be uh, put on the the government. And it's more embarrassing. But if you send them way out into the rainforest. Uh, then um, it's, it makes it very hard for their families to actually visit them. And um, also, if they die from, say, uh, starvation or they, if the prisoner dies because they, they don't get the medical attention that they need, you know, then um, it's a lot easier than to write off the death and just say, oh, the person got sick or whatever, um, you know, because... It's uh, out of sight, you know. The Bel know. you know, Bella Yala was so isolated and so far from Monrovia. I think it's um, if you fly from Spriggs Payne Airfield to the Bella Yala Airfield, I think it's like 250 miles, something like that. I have to look it up. It's in my article, but it's it's far, you know. So there's no roads going there. It's surrounded by rainforest, and so. I think it was later that especially President Tubman that thought that, hey, this is the ideal place to send political prisoners because they'll be out of sight. They'll be completely uh, isolated uh, in the rainforest in this in this uh, prison that's really meant for 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 soldiers. It's really a military uh, post stockade prison. That was never intended for civilian prison uh, prisoners. So, so I wonder the airport there. Uh, did it have regular uh, flights going there, or just military? Mm -hmm. Well, um, they small planes, only small planes. So they had these air taxis, which I was looking in the 1980s. They had these air taxis that's described. They're called. ARU, Army Air Reconnaissance Unit, and their air taxis that could hold up to 12 passengers in each plane. That's including the soldier guards. So these ARU planes could come and land on this very small airstrip, but they would only they could only land uh, during the daytime when the weather was clear, when there's no clouds because they're, the pilots were flying by eyesight, you know, no radar. And so if it was rainy, uh, overcast and rainy, they couldn't land. So they, they would have to go on a clear day to, during the daytime to land. That's how small the, the airstrip was. Yeah. And, uh, so, and then uh, right now what happened was the, the NPFL rebels, they planted trees on the airstrip so that no planes could land there. Yeah, they did that in my town too. When they got there, they okay. planted trees there. So Kai yeah. Jebel, there's a veteran soccer player from IE. Kai Jebel actually, we heard stories that there was no uh, path. People could just fly there. So describe the geography mm -hmm. again. I know we spoke about that earlier. Right. So the nearest town is Bopalu. And uh, even when I, when I went there the second time in 2015, 
there was a uh, a taxi from um, Douala Market actually, and we left in the middle of the night at Douala Market, and it took us about I don't know 15 hours or something to get there. But we went to when you go to Buffalo, it's still several hours to uh, to get to the area of Bella Yala, and I remember at one time. There was this big tree that fell down over the, over the road, you know, and the, the taxi driver had to get out. And they're trying to cut the tree, you know, to remove the tree from the road. You know, it's like very, and and the road uh, in the rainy season that that road can be underwater. You know, you could uh, several places where you could drive and the car would just be underwater. So, you know, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to to get there from Bopalu, which is the nearest town. And uh, the first time, like I said, uh, we could go to Tuma Creek, and then we had to go across on on that on that uh, raft, you know, being pulled across the creek with that photograph that we showed with the little raft to put the motor motorbike on the raft and go across that way. But it's very isolated, so you know, it, it made it very difficult for prisoners to escape. For all those reasons, they could get lost in the rainforest, they could get uh, eaten by wild animals, or they could be turned in by villagers who could expect to get a reward for turning them in. Uh, and there was all these draconian punishments if they were captured. They could be shot, or they could be, like I said, they could be have their their uh, their ankles broken, or different kinds of punishments for attempting to escape. So. Um, so, so that's it. You know, it was only recently they tried to put a, a small bridge over Tuma Creek. And um, there's another engineering challenge to that road. Going to Bella Yala, there's this big hill that's called Goma Hill. And they had to use dynamite to try to blow the rock apart with dynamite to try to pass the road over Goma Hill. And the second time that I went to Bella Yala, uh, everyone in the taxi had to get down and walk down wow. Goma Hill because it's so steep. It's like this, like really steep, right? So they uh, they use dynamite to blast the way uh, through the hill. And then still, it's so steep that you have to get out and walk down the hill where the taxi would be empty going down the hill. And then coming back, you'd have to get out of the taxi and walk up the hill before you could get back in the taxi again. So these are the uh, engineering challenges to building a road to Bella Yala. It's not easy. It's, um, there's some serious challenges. Wow. wow. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our, there's a poll currently going on on Focus on Liberia, uh, CPP primary poll. So you can click that link and be able to uh, take part in the, the poll. Well, uh, let me see if I get a few more comments. Uh, Nelly, who's also from that area, say from Bopulu, we cross Big River. From Bond County, we cross Big River. To cross over to other towns, you climb very big mountains. Bella Yala is an island. Right. So that, that mountain that she's talking about is that Goma Hill. You know, it's like a little mountain. You know, it's really, it's very steep. Yeah. So Clota say there is a hunger by Liberians to learn about their own history, but there is not many Liberian educators that are willing to put in the works to bring our history to life to be taught in schools. I disagree with you, Soklo. What do you think, uh, Dr. Tim? Mm. Uh, well, I, I taught history in Liberia for five years, and um, there are certainly, you know, uh, there are some there are some Liberian uh, professional historians that are very uh, passionate and dedicated to their craft. You know, Dr. Elwood Dunn, for example. You've got Dr. Uh, William Allen uh, at at LU. Uh, there's there's so many. There are there are. I would say there's a handful of Liberian professional historians that are working and and doing their best, but. Um, you know, in a country of five million people, that's that's not too many. It's, it's a small handful, a small group of people that are that are very passionate in writing about uh, about Liberian history. And uh, there's also the 
Liberian Studies Association, which is very interested in Liberian history. They're having their conference actually today was the last day of their, their three-day virtual conference. And so people from around the world tuned into that remotely. Um, so I, I think that uh, I think that the the interest is there. Um, I the only textbooks that I've seen on Liberian history being taught in schools are Joseph Seguanu, his textbooks. He was a neighbor of mine and a friend of mine at Cuttington University for three years. He's retired now. He's up in Santa Quelle right now, uh, retired. And those books are are pretty old now. They're, he wrote a book on Liberian civics and three books on Liberian history. But those are the only ones that I've seen, you know, photocopied over and over again yeah. and, and used in Liberian high schools. There has been a lot of recent research on Liberian history that's been published in the last 20 years. Right. The problem is it's not really accessible in Liberia. Um, and that's a big problem. There's no bookstores in Liberia to speak of. Right. And and uh, so Claude, there are a lot of materials on Liberia. And one of some of those are right here on Focus on Liberia. The yeah, videos right. are here. And so don't only use textbooks to teach. I think if the right. willingness is there on the part of uh, policy makers in Liberia, you can get materials to teach. They're all over the place on the internet, in the archives, and right here on Focus on Liberia. We had the Swakoko uh, discussion. Now we are having Bella Yala. That's history. Yeah. Transcribe it. Yeah, that's right. So, for example, when I, I did my, I put together my own PowerPoint presentations when I wanted to have a class uh, talking about the history of Firestone in Liberia, for example, the history of rubber, rubber uh, growing in Liberia. You know, I had to do my own research from various sources, and I put it together, and I and I made a PowerPoint using uh, photographs that I could find. So yeah. I, I I did it myself. You know, you're right. Uh, Dr. Tim, to this question, uh, Teddy Yankun said, more crew and crown warriors were executed at Bella Yala and European invaders. In your research, did you find anything about the dominant prisoners at uh, Bella mm -hmm. Yala? Were they of one ethnic group or did they come from a certain part of the country? Anything that you find has per the demographics? Were there other women I know of uh, Lucia Masale? Were there women? Were there girls? Who right. were the other people? Well, she, Lucia, who was so nice to talk with me and grant me an interview, um, you know, she had a very painful and difficult experience at Bella Yala, and she is the only um, female political prisoner uh, that I know of that was ever sent to Bella Yala. Uh, all the other political prisoners that I know of uh, were, were men. Um, however, in terms of the ethnic group, um, have to be more specific and break it down to different time periods. And I believe that during the 1950s and 1960s, uh, President Tubman became increasingly more paranoid um, as he got older and towards uh, the, his death in um, 1971. Uh, you know, he was, he was getting very old and and more sort of paranoid and also restrictive in terms of the political culture, you know, in Liberia and the uh, freedom of the press. You know, he was more restrictive about what people could write. And, you know, he had those uh, public relations officers, the PROs, they were basically his spies uh, sending him information on anyone who was perceived to be disloyal to him. And so, um, I would say during President Tubman's time, most of the political prisoners were actually uh, also uh, Americo Liberians that were from the political class that were being sent there. Now, there's a few other people that were considered, you know, political um, adversaries like Ditto Twe and uh, uh, Nisa de Brunel, uh, people like that uh, from the Crew Coast who were also uh, you know, indigenous political leaders who were um, considered to be a threat by President Tubman as well. But I would say, in general, most of the political prisoners sent to Beliala by Tubman uh, were American Liberians. Um, and then, uh, then the criminals 
uh, or people accused of different crimes, not political crimes, but other crimes, um, those would be mostly uh, indigenous people that had moved to Monrovia. So as you know, Monrovia is a melting pot. So everybody lives in Monrovia, right? From all the different ethnic groups, they're all there, all represented. Now, if you go to Doe's time during the PRC, the People's Redemption Council, which was a military junta, uh, during that time, uh, you had mostly uh, people that are perceived to be enemies by, by Doe being sent there. Uh, and then after the 1982, uh, 85, a Thomas Quiompa assassination attempt, which was, I mean, I'm sorry, a coup attempt, which is uh, an attempted coup. You had a lot of people from the uh, Gio and Mono ethnic groups, which is to say the Don people and Mono people being sent there to Bella Yala, especially um, Gio and Mono soldiers in the AFL. That was right around the time of the massacre at the St. Peter's Lutheran Church. You remember that? Uh, leading up to the um, 1990 invasion by Charles Taylor, which launched the Civil War, uh, the first Civil War. So anyway, so you have to look at the different time periods, but definitely um, you have more, you know, Mono and Gio people yeah. in prison there during during uh, the uh, Doe administration. But the um, but Alharic Tokpa, uh, who was a professor at University of Liberia at the time, and who was sent there with the um, five students, uh, including uh, Roland Dempster and uh, and uh, Lucia Mosley and Ezekiel Pajibo. Dempster Yala. Dempster Yala. Yeah, sorry, no, Dempster no. Yala, yeah. And, and Lucia Mosley, who's now uh, his wife. Um, and uh, also uh, Christian Herbert. And um, uh, so these people were all students at University of Liberia. They were not... Um, Definite, they were not coming from Nima County necessarily. They were sent to Bella Yala because they were considered to be uh, political agitators and to be a political threat yeah. to the those military regime. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. And you mentioned mm -hmm. LSA as we were talking about the uh, library history. They do a very good job on this. Yeah. Like, that's the Library Studies Association. Pretty soon we're going to have the Liberian Studies, the Liberian Studies Association Hour, right here on Focus on Liberia. That's going to be a scholarly stuff that they're going to be doing right here on Focus on Liberia. So keep it here. Here we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. Tomorrow, we're going to have power, gender, and equity in Liberia. Right here, and we're going to have a panel discussion with a cross-section of Liberians. Then next Sunday, we're going to have Universal Jurisdiction, a young Liberian doing her PhD in Dublin City University, will be talking about Universal Jurisdiction, the elaborate transitional justice process, a review of the TRC process, impunity, justice, reconciliation, peace, and reconciliation. Soon to be Dr. Tene Dalie will be our guest. In May week, you got to last more, man. Man cut is on plot. He's going to be here, and we say in Liberia, facts come true joke. So Mark Curtis will be our guest next week. Dr. Tim, thank you yeah. so much for honoring our invitation mm -hmm. again to be here. My audience want you back. So we're going to <laughs> keep bringing you All right. uh, as far right. as long as your schedule permits. We'll always be glad to have you. Your, fun, your closing comments as we draw down the curtain, sir. Right. Well, my closing comments are basically that um, I really wish to see the Bella Yala, former Bella Yala prison compound, be turned into uh, some kind of museum or some kind of memorial uh, to the political prisoners that were sent there over the years. Uh, and that is exactly what Ellen Johnson uh, Sir Leaf promised to do several times. Uh, she never uh, followed through on that promise, but um, the the people of Bella Yala would like that. Uh, they would uh, they would like to see the transition, you know, from the stigma of having his prison there in their town to a uh, site of memorial, a memorial site, uh, something like a museum type site with some exhibits and everything, 
that could someday draw visitors when the road is actually completed. When you have the road from Bapalu to Belayala uh, completed in such a way that it's passable during the rainy season as well as during the dry season, because that's the key. It has to be, the road has to be passable all year round. It can't just be part of the year I can maybe get through, but it has to be, you know, all the all all year round uh, passable road to Belayala. Then visitors could come and see for themselves. They could see the place for themselves. And the the area, the Belayala uh, town, that area is a strikingly beautiful uh, physical location. It's hilly. It's got rivers. It's it's got forest. It's it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful area, and uh, a lot of great you know uh, friendly people live there. So they would like to have tourism. They would like to have visitors. And so my dream is, uh, you know, one day that that could be um, put in place. Um, I'm not sure if uh, if this the current president uh, really cares about this kind of thing <laughs> at all. But anyway, someday someone really needs to do it. Uh, it. It needs to happen at some point. A memorial at, at Bella Yala. That's what I would really love to see. Right. And we hope you stick around Bella Yala to be a part of that history moment so that we can yeah. have this memorial. Thank you so yeah. much again for coming. And we want to thank our audience, our viewers for watching and keeping it here. Please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Continue to support us. Just call in and say thank you. We like what you do. Keep us going. We appreciate you so much. And uh, at this time, we always like to end with our song that says, we are all Liberians. I mean, the history talking about it is very painful. I mean, the land yeah. Liberians have to go to suffer other Liberians just for political power, mm -hmm. for where, for power, just for nothing. And where are all of them today? Dead and gone. And so when leaders yeah. today doing the same thing, you wonder if they even have any idea how the people before yeah. them went for which they should be yeah. so wicked to one another for power. Well, I, I will. I will have to say that you know other countries have done the same thing. Like South Africa has Robben Island prison. You know, France had the Devil Island prison. In the United States, we had Alcatraz prison in San Francisco, which is on an island. So different states have done the same thing. The point is that it would be nice at some point to turn these prisons into a museum, like Alcatraz prison has been turned into a museum now. And you can have a memorial for the people that were unjustly sent there. Yeah. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. so, Bella Yella, you say, whether you were a packet picker or <laughs> a prisoner or whoever, yeah. you were sent there. And all of those things were wrong. I don't, there was no justification whatsoever. But this part of our history, very painful, but we have to learn from it. Why? Yeah. Because we are all Liberians and it takes us to do whatever we can to make our country that glorious land of liberty. Thank you and good night. We are Liberians. Liberians. Liberians people. Liberians.